Bom dia. Good morning, everybody. It's time for us to start. So I will uh, call, I have the pleasure to call for the, let's say, a welcoming address uh, to people that represent metaphorically and metonymically the, the forces that are engaged in here. Of course, our first address will be to to the World Cultural Council, who, of course, it's because of World Cultural Council that everything is happening. But for the welcome address, I will start by uh, calling our rector, Emilka Falcão, and then our host, uh, Professor Paulo Pires. Uh, Professor Emilka Falcão. Good morning. Dear Director of Coimbra's Department of Culture and Tourism, Dr. Paulo Pires, Honorable President of the World Cultural Council, Sir, Sir Fraser Stoddard, 2022 laureates and speakers, students, teachers, and researchers from the University of Coimbra, from the high schools Infanta Dona Maria, Don Duarte, and Avelar Brutero, from the College São Teutonio and Rainha Santa, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. The University of Coimbra is extremely pleased and honored to host for the first time in Portugal the 37th World Cultural Cancer Award Ceremony. The 2022 award ceremony itself will take place tomorrow in Sala dos Capelos and will be marked by the special solemnity of a great institutional act. But today, at São Francisco Convent Cultural Center, next to the Mondega River, an equally significant and important event is taking place, the special lectures of the World Cultural Council. Because of our commitment, uh, your commitment and generosity, hundreds of students, education and researchers, as well as members of society in, gen in general, we will have today the opportunity to hear the life testimony and benefit from the direct intellectual stimulus of exceptional speakers. This is the case of Professor Victoria Caspi, winner of the Albert Einstein World Award of Science, who unfortunately cannot be present due to COVID, but will present her lecture by video conference. Professor Claudia Mitchell, winner of the Jose Vasconcelos World Award of Education, and Professor Ginny Hume, winner of the Leonardo da Vinci World War of Arts. The three 2022 laureates will be joined by the lectures of two Nobel laureates, Professor Sir Fraser Stoddard, President of the WCC and the Nobel Laureate in Chemistry 2016, and Professor David Gross, Nobel Laureate in Physics in 2004 and member of the WCC. It is in such, such examples of an outstanding professional and personal path that we all can find the stimulus to overcome the challenges that accompany any process of growth and maturation. Because excellence is built on strong passions and genuine, genuine dedication. And it is also in, his, uh, in examples of excellence that lies the inspiration capable of turning the most improbable dreams into reali reality. Let me conclude by expressing the wish that we can promote a culture of tolerance, peace, and fraternity in a more sustainable world as they are essential pillars shared by the common values of WCC and the University of Coimbra. Thank you for your attention. Have a nice day. Thank you very much, uh, Emil, uh, Rector Emilka Falcão. I would like now to introduce Dr. Paulo Pires, who is Director of the Department of Culture of Tourism from the Municipality of Coimbra and of course our host. Please, Dr. Paul Pires, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning for all. Uh, 
Rector of the University of Coimbra, Professor Emilcar Falcão, Honorable President of the World Cultural Council, Sir Fraser Stoddart, 2022 laureates and speakers, welcome. Students, st teachers and researchers from the University and Coimbra, from the high schools in Santa Dona Maria, Don Duarte and Avelar Brutero, from the colleges Santo Antonio and Rainha Santa, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is with great pleasure and honor that the City Council collaborates with the University of Coimbra in the hosting year in the San Francisco Convent of the present edition of the World Cultural Council Award Ceremony by the first time in Portugal. And I ask you an applause for that. It's uh, remarkable that uh, this collective effort and energy between the World Cultural Council and the University of Coimbra that made possible this important and recognized event in the art of the center of Portugal. Thank you all for that. It's also symbolic and significant that uh, today and tomorrow this World Cultural Council will join the two river banks of the city, showing something that we all desire, a connected and unified territory called Coimbra, where the strength of the differences and singularities can guide us to a better future. Today, we received the special lectures of the World Cultural Council with inspirational guests in a, new, in a unique place where sacred and profane meet each other to celebrate the life of spirit, in the words of Paul Valéry. Without this powerful, and uh, if you allow me the metaphor, without this love triangle, education, culture, and science, life would be probably a big mistake. Thank you all for believing that we can do it, each one and together, here and now. Queria apenas uh, também dizer algumas palavras em, em português também, se me permitem, e, uh, dar novamente as boas-vindas a todos, e, em nome da Câmara Municipal, aqui ao Convento de São Francisco. Um, vivemos, uh, vivemos tempos muito desafiantes nesta contemporaneidade. Uh, de tempos de transição, de mudanças, de adaptações, e quero, quero muito sublinhar esta ideia também, tempos de sonhar mais alto contra a maioria das previsões e expectativas. Quase tudo à nossa volta, de alguma forma, nos impele a não arriscar, a não atravessar a pontos para a outra margem, mas ao mesmo tempo, numa espécie de inquietante dualidade que desenha os dias, estamos bem conscientes da urgência e da vitalidade de seguir em frente de dar o salto, de ser criativo e imaginativo, que é, porventura, o ato mais revolucionário que podemos conceber nos nossos dias. E para isso precisamos da cultura como essa espécie de máquina de guerra contra o banal, o óbvio, o repetitivo, o espectável. O acolhimento da, da 37ª cerimónia da entrega dos prémios do World Cultural Council em Coimbra só pode deixar-nos felizes e orgulhosos sendo de enaltecer aqui o papel da Universidade de Coimbra, primeira instituição de ensino superior em Portugal a receber este evento referencial. Dizer para terminar que uh, o município de Coimbra está fortemente empenhado em estabilizar um pensamento e uma narrativa diferenciadores e potentes para este território, sendo que em janeiro do próximo ano, o mesmo ano em que se celebra, falava nisso há bocadinho com, com o nosso magnífico reitor, no mesmo ano em que se celebra o décimo aniversário da classificação da Universidade Alta e Sofia como Património Mundial da Humanidade pela Unesco. E, nesse sentido, iremos apresentar publicamente uma estratégia para a cultura em Coimbra entre 2023 e 2030. Nesse âmbito, é para nós absolutamente fundamental esta efetiva e contínua, e gostava muito de sublinhar estas duas palavras, efetiva e contínua, 
a articulação estratégica entre a Autarquia, a Universidade de Coimbra e os demais agentes e players culturais, educacionais, sociais e económicos do Conselho e da Região. Esta abertura empática e simultaneamente focada ao outro é este movimento de olhar à volta, de olhar em redor, é essencial para desenharmos o futuro em Coimbra. Daí que o município e a, e a, e a universidade estejam neste momento a consolidar uma plataforma de compromisso, de convergência e de colaboração em vários segmentos da área cultural, a qual salvaguarda, por um lado, as missões e objetivos específicos de cada uma das instituições, mas, ao mesmo tempo, estabelece aqui um compromisso coletivo em prol de uma cidade e de uma região que se pretendem abertas ao mundo. Uh, fico muito contente, e há bocado o vice-reitor uh, Delfim não estava a falar nisso, fico muito contente de ver aqui tantos jovens, né? Tanto, tantos estudantes aqui. Um, isso, é de, isso é, de, é de enaltecer, é de sublinhar. E, e, e diria para terminar, e citando aqui um senhor que em 2023 vai estrear o seu próximo disco, aqui no Convento de São Francisco, aqui em Coimbra, diria que enquanto houver estrada para andar, a gente vai continuar. E acrescentaria que enquanto houver ventos e mondego, a gente não vai parar. Obrigado. Thank you very much, Dr. Paulo Pires. It is now time to go to the special lectures which will, of course, be all of them very special moments. And I would call uh, Professor, um, uh, Professor Constanza Providencia to present our first speaker, Professor Victoria Caspi. Uh, well, a couple of words also in Portuguese to warm up a little bit. Audience, uh, muito obrigado pela vossa presença. A nossa primeira uh, oradora, não pode, infelizmente, estar presente, como gostaria e como esperávamos até ontem, porque, infelizmente, por questões de saúde, por causa do Covid, que ainda paira por aí, não pôde viajar. Mas estará connosco com a sua apresentação e teremos a doutora Constança Providência, que será o nosso profeta e intérprete para todas as questões. Obrigada. Então, muito obrigado. É muito, muito bom estar aqui neste reunião. É com um grande prazer that I present Professor Vittoria Caspi, winner of the 2022 Albert Einstein World Award of Science. She holds a long throated chair in astrophysics and cosmology and distinguished James McGill Chair at McGill University and is director of the McGill Space Institute. Professor Vittoria Caspi has completed her undergraduate studies at McGill University and her PhD under the supervision of the astrophysicist Joseph Taylor at Princeton University. Joseph Taylor received the Nobel Prize together with Russell Hussle for the discovery of a pulsar, a neutron star that rotates in a binary. Victoria Akaspi has had an important contribution to our understanding of neutron stars, stars with extreme properties. Being a nuclear particle physicist, I'm very grateful for her contributions. In fact, neutron stars are the perfect laboratories to learn about dense nuclear matter, about the theory of strong force, quantum chromodynamics. But this is only possible if their properties are understood, if we are able to detect and interpret the information they send. The radius of one of these stars is not larger than 15 kilometers, although having a mass as large as one to two solar masses. And these objects may have periods of rotation almost as small as a millisecond. The fastest, the fastest known pulsar was discovered with the help of Professor Victoria Caspi and performs more than 700 rotations per second. She associated the second, for the second time a pulsar to a supernova remnant that had been discovered in 386 after Christ by the Chinese. The prize is awarded in recognition of Professor Victoria Caspi's fundamental contributions to our understanding of one of the most extreme forces, forms of stars known as magnetars. 
Magnet stars are neutron stars having the highest magnetic fields known in the universe. One million to 10 million Tesla. A normal neutron star has a field a thousand times smaller. The Earth has a field of about 50 micro Tesla. In particular, she has shown that two types of stars, the soft gamma repeaters and anomalous X-ray pulsars could be both explained as magnetars. A magnetar rotates slower than neutron stars and completes a period in one to 10 seconds. Presently, Professor Victoria Caspi leads the CHIME. This stands for Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Ex Experiment, the CHIME Radio Telescope in Canada, trying to understand another puzzle of the universe, fast radio bursts. She will be telling us about observations performed in, with this new instrument. Hello, this is Vicky Caspi, uh, recording my uh, lecture for the World Cultural Council in the University of Coimbra, because I'm not with you, having come down with COVID the night before I was supposed to board my plane. I was already packed. I was very, very excited to come. And I'm so sorry not to be there in Coimbra with you and not to see your beautiful city and your spectacular university and not to be able to congratulate my co-honorees, Professor Claudia Mitchell, my McGill colleague, and also Professor Jay Myun Nguyen in person for their awards and other awardees. I'm so sorry not to meet Sir Fraser Stoddard, president of the World Cultural Council, and also very sorry not to be able to say hello to Professor David Gross, uh, who I have known since I was a graduate student at Princeton University and who was a very positive force at many stages of my career. I'm also very sorry not to be able to thank in person Ms. Lily Hernandez and everyone who has put so much effort into what I am certain is a spectacular event. But such is life. And as I sit here in my bedroom, hiding from my family to avoid infecting them, I'm very grateful for the technology that allows me to be with you even a little bit today. I will now um, tell you about the transient radio sky. And to do that, I would like to share my screen. The transient radio sky. Well, when people ask me what my research is about, I often say, I don't know, because I'm studying an object that is truly mysterious and we do not know what it is. And I hope by the end of this talk, you too will not know <laughs> what these objects are, but at least we'll have a better appreciation for what the mystery is. And also we'll appreciate better some of the uh, twists and turns that are involved in doing science at the forefront. You'll see there's a lot of surprises along the way as we try and unravel this mystery. The mystery of these short radio bursts that I will be telling you about, fast radio bursts, has captured the imagination of the press and the public at large. You can see here some examples of the sorts of press these objects have gotten. But really, I want to, before telling you about these objects and what we're trying to understand, I want to take a step back and remind us all about what most people think about the night sky. Here's a beautiful optical image taken with a conventional optical radio telescope of a constellation that some of you might be familiar with, the Orion constellation, the Hunter. You can see beautiful stars here. It's known as the Hunter from mythology, of course, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, which immediately tells you that people way back then saw pretty much the same object that we see tonight. The same stars are there. This configuration of stars, of course, they're not really related. Uh, some are at vastly different distances than others. 
they just appear that way projected on the sky from Earth's vantage point. But this configuration is pretty stable. And if you come back 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, 100,000 years, you'll probably see the same thing on the sky. And that, in some ways, is quite comforting. Of course, all of these stars are just like our favorite star, the sun, in our own solar system. And we're very familiar with that object, and it's also comforting. It rises in the morning and sets at night, and it's always there. But you might not have realized that the sun itself actually uh, is quite a, a variable place. This is a movie of our sun taken with NASA's SOHO mission in the light of an ultraviolet light. And you can see, first of all, the sun rotates. The sun has all sorts of uh, interesting um, plasma effects going on, having to do with its magnetic field and variations in its magnetic field. It sometimes has huge eruptions. So stars are actually not stable and fixed permanently. They have interesting time variability associated with them. And, you know, we've known about this for many hundreds of years. In fact, Galileo himself, over 400 years ago, sketched out. This is a reproduction of a sketch that he made. The moons of Jupiter that he saw first with a, with a telescope, realizing that they had orbits, that the planets orbit and things orbit the planets. There's, there's dynamics, the dynamical universe. Things change when you start looking close enough. And with modern telescopes, we can see all sorts of variability on the sky. Here's one example. This is a movie, uh, an artist's rendition of what we believe is uh, how, if we could get really close to what we call a nova, that is one star that dumps material onto a second star, typically a white dwarf star creating a thermonuclear explosion, which is witnessed as a very bright, great optical brightening, ultraviolet, sometimes X-ray brightening in the sky. We call that a nova. We see those, and these are very well studied on the sky. And that sort of explosion happens, uh, you know, it takes days to, to weeks uh, it will last. And then we know of other types of explosions, for example, we now can see and we have ob directly observed collisions of compact objects called neutron stars, very, very dense objects, sometimes found in binary systems. And here in this movie, you can see the system is, the two stars are approaching each other in their orbit, and soon they're going to merge in a huge explosion we refer to as a kilonova, a very, very large style nova. That means lots and lots of energies released. And so there's many objects in the sky that explode or have instabilities that cause flaring or um, bursting. There's th This is ubiquitous in the night sky as astronomers have learned uh, over the last several decades. And as I said uh, earlier than that as well. Now, my talk is about the transient radio sky. And so let me tell you about that. But first, let's make sure, sorry, that we're all on the same page when I say radio. So most of you, I hope, know what this device is. I think young, very young people probably have no clue what this is, but I think most of us know that this is a radio. It's a device that has an antenna that detects radio waves that cause a current in the antenna that's then read into amplifiers and various analog electronics. This is the dial that allows a listener to specify a specific radio frequency uh, to listen to. And you can think of the different frequencies. And here is the FM. This is 88 megahertz or 95 megahertz. These are like different colors of, uh, of light or of radio light in analogy with the different colors that our eyes can see, which are also different frequencies. Here we have different frequencies and you can adjust this. In, in this radio, you can turn a dial and you can tune 
so that you allow the speaker to um, emit only the signal that is coming at a specific radio frequency. And so that's what we're familiar with with radio. But of course, radio waves are actually just a type of light. Uh, just we're, we're familiar with light in the visible range because that's what our eyes are sensitive to. And perhaps it's no surprise that our eyes evolved in that way because we live near a sun that produces predominantly visible light. But the full electromagnetic spectrum includes many other types of light that our eyes cannot see, but which we make use of. I mentioned ultraviolet before. We can't see it, but you're familiar with it uh, being produced by the sun. X-rays, gamma rays, infrared light, microwaves, and radio waves, the lowest frequency electromagnetic waves that are used by astronomers. The lower the frequency uh, the micro so microwaves you're familiar with from a microwave oven, the low lower frequencies uh, are are radio waves. And so, when I say talk about these bursts, which is what I I want to tell you about this mystery that I mentioned earlier, these fast radio bursts. These are bursts of radio waves that last only a few thousandths of a second. We are seeing them all over the sky. The first one was detected with this radio telescope. So you think, tell as many people when they think telescope, they think of an optical telescope, but we also have radio telescopes that are sensitive to radio waves from the cosmos. And here's one of them. This is a radio telescope in Parks, Australia, which detected the first such uh, radio burst. And we believe that these radio bursts that last just a blink of an eye are ubiquitous. That is, if you could look everywhere on the sky all day long, you would detect upwards of a thousand of these every day. And this phenomenon presumably has been happening for hundreds of thousands, millions, billions of years. But it's technology, modern technology that's allowed us to be able to detect them only today. It's really driven by the computer gaming industry that has given us the computer power to be able to see these today. I'll explain more about that. But the bottom line is that these bursts that are happening all over the sky, their origin is unknown. We don't know what they are. And I can say for sure they're not microwave ovens and that might perplex you why I'm saying that, but I'll explain shortly. So you might wonder, well, how do you see a radio burst? And here's an artist concept you'll see in some popular press. This is not how we see a radio burst. We can't see radio waves. If we would need big antennas for eyes to be able to see them. So how do we see them? This is the first ever detected fast radio burst. We call it the Lorimer burst, named after the uh, first author on the publication uh, who reported it. And what you can see here on the x-axis of this plot, this is time. And this is just 500 milliseconds, that is half, um, half a, a second. And on the y-axis here is radio frequency, where using a radio telescope, we are sensitive to many, many radio frequencies all at once. And you can see this black horizontal line here. That is a television station that emits at a single radio frequency uh, for all times. And the cosmic signal is this burst that's sweeping through the band that arrives at the highest radio frequencies first and slowly makes its way down to the slowly a few hundred milliseconds <laughs> that's not so slow i guess uh to the uh lowest radio frequencies now i'm going to stop for one moment and pause the recording. Hello, I'm back. Sorry. 
if you've never had COVID and I, this is my first time having COVID, my goodness, it's, it's something. In any case, what I was trying to say is that the sweep we can correct for in software. So what you're seeing here is the digitization of the signal. We digitize it in time as well as in radio frequency. And we store these bits on computer disks and we can correct in software for this delay across the radio frequencies. And that's what you see in the inset is when we correct in software and line all of these, the radio waves up, we get a single burst. We get just noise, just garbage to start with the burst that's cosmic. And then nothing after that, it goes away and it doesn't come back. That's a fast radio burst. And what I want to tell you is that by analyzing the amount of this delay, the, the degree to which it sweeps through, we call that the dispersion of the radio wave. We know that this event has come from far, far outside our Milky Way galaxy. And in fact, from co a cosmological distance, meaning from an appreciable fraction of, uh, di from appreciable distance, that's an appreciable fraction of the scale of the universe. And that's a pretty bold statement. Let me first, let's all be sure we understand when I say outside our Milky Way galaxy, what I mean. Here is a picture not of our Milky Way galaxy. Of course, when you're inside your own house, it's hard to get a picture of the outside of, the outside of it. So we can't get a picture of our own Milky Way galaxy very easily. Uh, but this is a galaxy probably not too similar. And we are situated on the edge of the spiral galaxy. Uh, of the Milky Way galaxy, something like this, if, if this were it. And what do I mean by the size of the universe? Well, here's a, a, a graphic that shows different scales of the universe. Of course, the first starting here, we all familiar with the earth and the solar system. And each time we're zooming out, the last image is shown in red, um, the, the, roughly the scale. So you can't quite, the earth is just a speck here. Uh, on the scale of the solar system. But we could zoom out further than that to the <clears throat> nearest, uh, to the interstellar neighborhood where our solar system itself is just a speck and you see the closest stars to us. And then you can zoom out from the nearest interstellar neighborhood to the full scale of the Milky Way galaxy. And that's, you see, we're on the edge, as I mentioned, but that's the Milky Way galaxy is just a little speck as is the full neighborhood of, of stars around us. But you can keep zooming out of our galaxy into the local galactic group where our galaxy is now just a smudge. You can see it here. And you can zoom out of our local galactic group, uh, which by the way, contains other galaxies like the Andromeda galaxy. Um, and you can zoom out of the local galactic group to the Virgo supercluster. This is a supercluster of galaxies where groups of galaxies now appear as just a blob on this scale. And you can zoom out even further to the local, to the local superclusters of which our supercluster is just one member and the entire supercluster of galaxies um, itself is part of a group of superclusters of galaxies. And then you can zoom out even further. And here we reach the scale of the observable universe. Note that it's homogeneous. It looks pretty much the same everywhere. And we're just one tiny smudge on this scale here. And this is billions, the scale of billions of light years. And it's on this scale that we think these fast radio bursts are arriving from. Now, that's a bold statement. How can I justify it? Let me explain about dispersion of light. You're all actually familiar with dispersion of light. When you take white light through a prism, it splits it into the different colors of the rainbow because white light is made up of those colors. The prism diffracts the light in, it spreads it out uh, by different amounts depending on the frequency of the light. So different frequencies get spread in different ways. And this is responsible for the, for the rainbow. Uh, light from the sun passing through water droplets. Also, um, I said diffracts before I meant refracts the light so that um, the different colors come out at different locations. 
But what's also happening here is that the different colors are also traveling at different speeds in the material. And that's what another way of using the word dispersion, you might have thought that the speed of light is a constant. We see Einstein's favorite fa famous formula e equals mc squared. The c there is the speed of light. And you might think, well, that's a constant and it's the law and all light travels at the speed of light. But that's true, but only in a vacuum. Once you're inside a material, light travels slower than the speed of light. And for many materials, it travels at a speed that depends on its frequency. And that is what's happening with radio waves. Space is not a vacuum. Of course, you wouldn't want to go in space and try and breathe there because, yes, it's not a vacuum, but the gas there is very tenuous and you would indeed suffocate because there's not enough uh, of the gases you, you would need to breathe. But it's not a vacuum. You can see with your own eyes, if you get a beautiful image, this is, this is the Milky Way galaxy as we see it here on Earth. There's lots of dust, gas, stars, all sorts of things. Um, and in particular, one thing that you can't see with your eyes, but which we know is present, are free electrons. There's, there's, the galaxy is filled with hydrogen gas, and a lot of that hydrogen gas is ionized, meaning that the electrons have been stripped off their protons, and we have many free electrons here in, in the galaxy. And it's those free electrons that disperse radio waves. And let me explain what I mean. Imagine here's Earth, and here's a radio telescope I will tell you about shortly, the Chime telescope. And I'm going to produce a radio burst here, but show it in optical light so that you could see the colors of the rainbow. What you'll see is that all the colors are produced at the same time at the source, but then as they travel through this material, this gas, or these free, here meant to show free electrons, the radio wave, the, the, the waves get dispersed. So there's the bright source. It's all white. It's like it's white light. But then the colors get spread out because they're traveling at different speeds and the highest frequencies arrive at Earth before the lowest frequencies. So I've shown you the fast radio burst source dispersing in that way in optical colors, but really it's happening to the radio waves. It's radio waves that get dispersed by free electrons. And so we know in our galaxy, so pretend this is the Milky Way galaxy again, this below it is a model for the distribution of free electrons in our galaxy. We know this, and this is well studied and well calibrated using other sources that are inside the galaxy for whose distance we, we know and we can see how much dispersion they suffer depending on how far away they are. So we've learned about the distribution of free electrons in our own galaxy. Here, this is the center of our galaxy and we're over here on the spiral arm. Um, and so we've produced models of our own Milky Way galaxy and here it's, unfortunately, it's rotated the galactic center. The center of our galaxy is here where the cross is. And this little thing that looks like Pac-Man, that's where the solar system is. And what you're seeing here are contours, like a, a, con like a contour map. But in this case, a map of constant total free electron, um, we call it the column depth. That is the, the amount of free electrons between us and a source in any direction in the galaxy. So if you look in this direction and the source is this far away, you have this, this is the quantification of how many free electrons you've had to travel through. And this is really actually a three-dimensional model. That is, it's not just in the plane of the galaxy, it's in all directions we know how many electrons there are in any line of sight, in any direction this model can tell us this. And in particular, it tells us the maximum number of electrons that are present in our galaxy to disperse light, to disperse radio light. In any direction, we know there's a maximum because eventually the galaxy ends. And then in the intergalactic medium, well, that's extremely tenuous plasma. That's, there's, there still are free electrons, but they're very tenuous. And so coming back to the Lorimer burst and to fast radio bursts, the degree to which these radio waves are dispersed is, apps, is way more than can possibly be explained in this direction of the galaxy. 
the maximum, we call it the dispersion measure, how much dispersion had this these radio waves have suffered, the maximum due to our galaxy is only 25 in these crazy units, not important, but only 25. Whereas this burst is so dispersed, its dispersion measure is 375, much, much higher than what the galaxy can produce. And this is what's telling us it's far, far outside our galaxy. And once you realize that these bursts are coming from far outside our galaxy, from great distances, to be able to detect them here, they must be extremely powerful events in the universe. It must be some sort of explosion where perhaps we're only seeing the tip of the explosion, the brightest moment of that, the brightest few milliseconds of that explosion. But it's extremely luminous to be seen across cosmological distances. Now, Lorimer and his colleagues found a few of these sorts of events. And then also, a Parkes radio telescope discovered some other events that looked a little bit different. And I want to tell you about this, because um, it's quite interesting. This is an example of an event they found in their data. It looks very similar to the Lorimer event, except it's sort of clumpy, and it has these kind of strange features. And it had other properties that were a little odd. and. Uh, the Australian team started studying these, and they noticed a very interesting phenomenon. This is a plot showing time of day on the x-axis, where this is noon, local time in Australia. And this is the number of events they detected, where the gray ones are these strange strange sweeps, the, what we call, they call them the peritons, strange looking, didn't quite make sense. And the dark gray ones, well, those are events that didn't look strange. They had a, a nice uniform sweep. And it's very curious that the peritons all occur at, or mostly occur around lunchtime. And that was what we call in science suspicious, <laughs> because the cosmos should not know when it's lunchtime in Australia. And indeed, it turned out that a periton is produced whenever the telescope was pointing at the visitor center where there's a microwave oven. And if that microwave oven was being operated and was opened prematurely by a very hungry and impatient user, it would produce a periton. And it's actually a graduate student who stood there, you know, opening and closing the microwave oven with the telescope pointed at it and proved that the peritons were actually the microwave oven, the local microwave oven. And why am I telling you this crazy story? Because I'm so proud of the scientific community, which published in one of the most prestigious journals in, science, in astronomy, the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. They identified the source of peritons at the Parkes Radio Telescope um, as uh, being when a microwave oven door is open prematurely. <laughs> and... Um, so this was, I, I think science is wonderful. We, when we're wrong, we say it and we admit it publicly. We, we publish our results. And also this had the result that we then could feel confident that the dark gray ones in that plot, the, the sweeps, which are not distributed in any special way in the Australian day as a cosmic event should be. Uh, that these are excellent candidates for genuine extragalactic transients. And indeed, they were right. Uh, we've now been detecting FRBs at many different radio telescopes, as I'll describe. And, you know, you might say, okay, what are these things? Could they be exploding stars like some of the ones I showed you at the start? Could they be colliding neutron stars? Could they be a neutron star colliding with a black hole? And, and I'm, I'm listing these mo possible models because these are all in the literature. For a while, there were more models for what FRBs are than there were um, actual events detected. Uh, but there's many, many possibilities. And uh, I put the bottom one, magnetars, as one in blue, because it's one of the leading models. So one question I get asked frequently is, well, what, what's a leading model for what fast radio bursts are? And it's magnetars. So what are magnetars? Magnetars are observed in our own galaxy, ultra highly magnetized young neutron stars, very, very dense object. 
where the magnetic fields are the highest known in the universe and are unstable so that the star will occasionally, and here I mean every few years, explode in a giant burst of X-rays and gamma rays. And these are observed ubiquitously. In fact, uh, I worked on magnetars for many, many years. So I would, I could, I could talk your ear off about magnetars, but I'm, I'm holding back here uh, because magnetars were not known for very large radio bursts. They're known for large gamma ray and, and X-ray bursts, but not for large radio bursts. So some people thought there's enough energy there to produce these radio bursts, uh, but it's a phenomenon that has not been seen from magnetars. Just hold that thought. Now, you might say, why don't you just go and look where the fast radio burst is coming from? See where it is. What type of galaxy is it? Is it in a young galaxy? Is it an old galaxy? See where it is in the galaxy. Is it at the center of the galaxy? Is it at the edge of the galaxy? Those could be clues to what these objects are. But there's a problem. And the problem is that radio telescopes do not pinpoint locations of sources very well. So the Parkes telescope that discovered the Lorimer burst and a few other fast radio and many other fast radio bursts, it can only localize on the sky to within a region that's extremely large, which contains literally thousands of galaxies. So you can't possibly know which galaxy it came from, never mind where in the galaxy it came from. You say, well, oh, that's too bad. How can you beat that? How can you do better? Now, it turns out you can go to a larger telescope. And for a while, long time, this, the largest telescope in the world was the Arecibo teles Telescope in Puerto Rico. It has ceased operations. Uh, but it is a 300-meter telescope. That's very large. Several football fields across. And still, you would find hundreds that that is the localization region of a much larger telescope the larger than the largest telescope on earth still doesn't do the job there's still many dozens of galaxies in there in order to pinpoint the galaxy you need what we call an interferometer which is an array of many many radio telescopes all observing in tandem and uh separated sometimes by uh kilometers or even hundreds of kilometers, or even thousands of kilometers, interferometers. And for example, the 25 kilometer baseline, we say that the, the, the separation of antennas, the largest separation of the very large array telescope in New Mexico, New Mexico in the United States, it can pinpoint. And so you might say, why don't you go to the very large array telescope and look and see and find a fast radio burst so you could pinpoint. The problem is because you don't know where or when these events are going to go off. They're transient. You can't predict it. So the, you, you could point the very large array for 10 years and never see a single burst because its field of view is tiny. The burst is happening over here. So it's a problem. Now, let me tell you about the Arecibo Observatory. I mentioned it's in Puerto Rico. This is a 300. It doesn't function anymore. It actually suffered a terrible collapse. You can see this online if you want to see the, the, the very sad disappointing collapse of the Arecibo Observatory. But when it was functioning, this is a 300 meter aperture. This is me at the top of the aperture here. If you zoom in, my knuckles are white. It is frightening. It was frightening up there. This is the catwalk that you walked up. This is a catwalk. This is a three-story visitor center down here, just to set the scale. In any case, that's the Arecibo Observatory. Those are a couple colleagues of mine. And we just started detecting, we were doing a survey for these objects and we started, we detected a fast radio burst. This is the first one we detected. And you see here the telltale sweep um, as a function of time, the radio wave sweeping in here is correcting for the dispersion, de the de-dispersed burst. You see a lovely burst. And to our amazement, we sat there and continued to observe with the telescope, this region of the sky. And it was actually my student that discovered, my student, Paul Schultz. Here's a picture of Paul Schultz, PhD student at the time, discovered that this burster repeats, unlike any of the Parks ones before it, which would burst and never come back. This one, we waited and waited. And in one hour observation, we saw 10 more bursts from it. And here they are. In this case, we've already removed the dispersion in software, but they're all they're all dispersed by the exact same amount. 
And we were just absolutely shocked that these bursters can repeat. Because if you imagine a model where they're colliding neutron stars or colliding stars of any kind, they're not going to collide 10 times in an hour. And, and then we've seen this thing a thousand times since. So that just immediately ruled out a whole class of models. It was a shock to us. And you can see we got lots of press about it again. And the amazing thing is it immediately ruled out a class of models, but also allowed us to now go and propose to an interferometer, the very large array in New Mexico, because we had a place to point. And we could say there's something there. And if you wait long enough, you're going to see it and you're going to localize it and we'll see what kind of galaxy it's coming from. And we did this experiment. We had to ask for the time. We went there uh, and we sat there for 60 hours, 60 hours, which is a lot of time on the very large array. And we saw no bursts. The sky was not cooperating. Uh, but we were very certain of ourselves and we kept asking and in a test observation, a, a, another t in, in, in several months later that they gave us, boom, in this radio image taken with a very large array, you can see that these circles are the error regions from the Arecibo telescope. We knew it was somewhere in these two circles. And bing, this is the location of the radio burster, which was detected with a very large array at the same with the same amount of dispersion. And this is, by the way, technically very challenging at a telescope like the very large array. But we had it localized. We knew we could pinpoint it on the sky, and then we could go to an optical telescope and look and see what galaxy was there. So um, we actually, with the VLA, we didn't just catch one burst. We caught nine bursts. It turns out this thing doesn't burst randomly. When it's active, it's producing lots of bursts, and then it'll be dormant for months. That's a clue to what it is, but we don't know what it means. Interesting. Isn't it interesting? I find it interesting. I hope you are finding this interesting too. I can't see your faces, so I don't know. In any case, we went uh, with the position from the VLA. We went to the eight meter Gemini telescope in Hawaii, a, one of the largest optical telescopes. And we this is the optical image. We got this blue square down here. Um, we were shocked again. It's, like I said, this this story has many twists and turns and surprises. You never know what's going to happen in science. We were shocked. We were expecting a beautiful spiral galaxy of some kind, or perhaps an elliptical galaxy, something, a nice large galaxy. Instead, it turns out this object was in a tiny little dwarf galaxy. You could barely see it. Uh, and it turns out there's many dwarf galaxies in the universe. So they're, they're quite common in the universe, uh, but they don't contain much mass. They're very, they're, they're, the, most of the mass is not in these things. Um, so, but... The good news was, so this was a puzzle, why in a dwarf galaxy? But the good news was that we could measure the distance to the galaxy. Once you see the galaxy, we have techniques. It's called measuring the redshift for those of you familiar, but don't worry if you're not. We knew the distance and we could confirm that it was indeed at a cosmological distance as our arguments about dispersion measure had indicated. So that was very gratifying that science was working, that we thought we understood about galaxy dispersion. And indeed, when we finally pinpointed this first fast radio burst source, uh, it was in a galaxy that was far away. And we got lots of press. Uh, the New York Times reported it was traced to a faraway galaxy, but the caller is probably ordinary physics, which was amusing because I don't think this is so ordinary, but never mind. Meanwhile, a different newspaper in New York reported that it could be aliens. And I just want to say here and now that we do not think this is anything but a natural phenomenon. Just have to get that out there. In any case, where did we stand pre-2019? I'm not 100% sure about the time I have left, so I want to at least take a few more minutes to tell you where we stand today. As of 2019, it was clear one fast radio burst repeats and it ruled out colliding stars for the source and anything that can't repeat. And it enabled the first sky localization, but it left many questions unanswered. Do all FRBs repeat? What is the bursting source? Why is it in a tiny galaxy? It was just clear we had to find more. And so we had to find more of these objects. So now I want to tell you briefly about the experiment that we're doing now in Canada, the CHIME telescope. This is a radio telescope. It stands for the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment, which might immediately tell you that it was designed for a totally different purpose than it was. 
It was not designed to study fast radio bursts, but it turns out it's phenomenal at doing it. I'll explain why. This is a very unusual geometry radio telescope. It's made of cylinders. Each is 100 meters long, 100 meters long by 20 meters wide. So the total area of this telescope is about equal in Canadian hockey, in Canadian units to five hockey arenas. Uh, I love to make that joke, but really this is high tech stuff. This is a transit telescope that is always looking up. It has no moving parts. And on each axis of each cylinder, there's 200 hanging, hanging there, there's 256 antennas that are all being read uh, and digitized extremely fast at extremely high data rate into uh, sophisticated uh, computing infrastructure located both under the telescope and to the side of the telescope in these specially custom designed shipping containers. The input data rate uh, from all of these antennas into the telescope, into what we call the correlator of the telescope is 13 terabits a second, which is equivalent to the world's, uh, uh, roughly equivalent to the world's cellular um, network, uh, all cellular networks combined. This is a very uh, technologically challenging uh, project. And uh, you can see here, first of the scale of the project, this is a bunch of the, a team members standing along the axis, just to show you how large it is. Um, and this is a diagram showing you the uh, different cylinders and how they go into these uh, boxes, uh, which do digitization and frequency analysis using field programmable gate arrays uh, into a uh, uh, another set of computers that analyzes the data and produces spatial uh, beams on the sky that allows us to search uh, for fast radio bursts. These are made of gaming computers, GPUs as we call them. And then the search engine that search for fast radio bursts is made of conventional, uh, 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 about 130 uh, computers that are all constantly searching in real time for fast radio bursts all over the sky. At the same time as we are making maps of the sky in neutral hydrogen and also even studying uh, another uh, astrophysical object called pulsars. Um, you can see, uh, yeah, I explained this, that the, 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 uh, the, 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 the start of the, the beginning, the first portion of the correlators under the dishes, you can't see it. There's a house, there's a little hut there that you can walk and stand. You could have 10 people in there if you wanted. And these are shipping containers, uh, that have the fast radio burst engine and the, uh, X engine. And, um, these are some of the students and postdocs who are responsible for building this telescope. This is very much student. This is my student, uh, Ziggy Plenis. Um, and other uh, members of the team who've worked very, very hard, lots of cables involved here, um, building antennas, and here are the computers. You see, it's a very um, sophisticated uh, experiment. And so why is it so good at fast radio bursts? The Parkes telescope, it's a spherical aperture. It can see a tiny region of the sky only. And so most of these transients events are happening in different places, and this telescope can't see it. Sometimes it gets lucky, and so it's able to detect a few. But for the most part, it doesn't see the vast, vast majority of, of fast radio bursts on the sky because its field of view is so small. Now, a cylinder, on the other hand, it only focuses in one dimension. And so it sees a massive swath on the sky, many hundreds of several hundreds of degrees. And so this is orders of magnitude greater field of view that enables it to catch more of these transient events. So if you compare the field of view of the cylinder to the field of view of a circular aperture, you see it's orders of magnitude larger, which allows it to detect orders of magnitude more events. And so as the sky rotates overhead, you see we have a much greater chance of detecting these transient events. And that's why CHIME is such a powerful radio telescope for fast radio bursts. Uh, and indeed, as soon as we started, we turned it on, we started detecting them and, and Nature Magazine wrote us up. Very exciting. This is a histogram of the number of fast radio bursts that have been detected up until 2019 by different telescopes around the globe. Here you can see the gray ones are the Parkes telescope. Um, there's other telescopes, the Arecibo telescope found a couple. Uh, but when CHIME turned on, 
this is the number of fast radio bursts that is now known, and this is in 2019, if the pace has continued, uh, because of our enormous field of view, we are detecting hundreds, in fact, by now thousands of fast radio burst sources and allows us to uh, study the phenomenon in, in great detail. And so we have discovered now uh, literally dozens of repeating fast radio burst sources. We're uncovering a whole population on the sky. And because you have dozens of these events, uh, you can now discern interesting um, properties that, for example, the repeaters, it turns out their bursts tend to be on average a little longer than those of the non-repeaters. Um, the, 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 the range of radio waves that they produce, the spectra are also a little different. We're starting to, when you have a population, then you can do some very interesting science and gives you clues to what these things are. Perhaps repeaters are a different class of fast radio bursts. Maybe there's many things in the universe that could produce fast radio bursts. Um, we also, one of the major discoveries our group made was detecting a very luminous radio burst from a Milky Way magnetar, from a magnetar in our own galaxy. And you can see it was actually two very, very bright bursts coming from our own galaxy, which immediately suggested, ah, this is why it's the leading model for fast radio bursts. We've seen one produce for the first time a radio burst that was sufficiently luminous that had it occurred in a nearby galaxy, it would have looked just like a fast radio burst. That was super exciting, but, and I'm going to show you a plot that's a little technical because I, and, and bear with me um, for those of you, I just, what I'm trying to show here is this is brightness on the y-axis and distance on the x-axis. These are galactic sources um, that we've known and studied. These are all in our galaxy. Here's the magnetar burst, extremely high brightness, uh, luminosity inside our own galaxy. These are fast radio bursts over here. These are lines of constant energy. And so the point is that this source nicks the, the bottom of these uncertainty regions for fast radio bursts that's, that, that are the weakest fast radio bursts. So the magnetar was as bright as the faintest fast radio bursts, but there's many more, far, far more energetic fast radio bursts that we have observed. Uh, are those also magnetars? We don't know. That we don't know. We can say some fast radio bursts are magnetars. We can't say they are all magnetars. So wrapping up the CHIME fast radio burst project, we have lots of fast radio bursts. We are analyzing them all. We are learning so much about the population, um, uh, both by finding individual interesting sources like the galactic magnetar and some others that I don't have time to tell you about, and by studying populations of these objects and seeing statistical differences between subgroups. Very, very interesting. And in summary, you know, these objects are still mysterious. I can't tell you what they all are. Some may be magnetars, but we don't know if all or even most are. Some repeat could be multiple classes of objects. And the CHIME telescope in Canada is helping to solve this mystery. Um, the last point I want to make is just that even, even if we never figure out what these objects are, even if we never figure out what they are, I haven't had time to describe it to you in this talk, but they are, these fast radio bursts are fantastic probes of the universe, the cosmic web of the universe at its largest scales. The radio waves probe and give us fantastic novel information about large scale structure in the universe. And so even if we never figure out what they are, we are going to learn a tremendous amount about the universe just by studying fast radio bursts. And so with that, I say thank you very much for your attention. And I'm, again, so sorry I couldn't be there to answer questions. If any of you has a question you'd like to ask, please feel free to email me. And I hope that you have a wonderful rest of uh, your day and uh, this, the, the rest of the talks are are interesting. I'm so sorry I can't be there. Uh, thank you very, very much for your attention.